Dr. Seymour Tracy is an ordinary American man. He lives in a two-bedroom home with a white picket fence in an ordinary suburban town in the Midwest. He gets up every day and goes to work. Then in the evening, he comes home to spend time with his family. From the outside, Seymour and his family couldn't be more normal. But in reality, there's something very abnormal about him, his life, and the neighborhood where he lives. Seymour Tracy isn't just some office worker. He's a researcher employed by the SCP Foundation, just like all of his neighbors. Because this isn't an ordinary neighborhood, it's a functioning Site 11 satellite facility, bought and maintained by the Foundation for the sole purpose of containing and monitoring a single SCP, SCP-3082. SCP-3082 is an ordinary treehouse, 2 meters by 2 meters in size and built from ordinary cherry wood planks and it's located in one of the trees in the neighborhood park. You might expect that an anomaly that requires an entire suburb of people to monitor it is exceptionally difficult to contain. But the truth is, SCP-3082 is only a Euclid-class anomaly, fairly tame by Foundation standards. The fact that the houses surrounding this SCP are inhabited solely by Foundation personnel and their families is, more than anything, a way to keep up appearances of this being a completely normal neighborhood. Unlike most Foundation sites, the personnel working in this unorthodox setup around SCP-3082 are mostly researchers, and their work is just as much anthropological and diplomatic as it is scientific. As you might have guessed, SCP-3082 isn't a normal treehouse on the inside. Open up this small hatch in the wall and step through and you'll find yourself in a much larger, grander treehouse that rests on the upper branches of an absolutely massive conifer-like tree of an unidentified species. The tree, designated as SCP-3082-1, is an incredible 160 kilometers tall, and while its own species is not known, it appears to have multiple recognizable plants grafted onto and growing out of its bark. Many of these plants are fruit-bearing, and in addition to the identifiable plants, there are also a number of pitcher plant-like flowers that collect and hold fresh water. These plants serve as sustenance for the only known inhabitants of SCP-3082, a colony of around 74 children, all between the ages of 4 and 12. These children live in a village made up of other tree houses built among the branches of SCP-3082-1, and all of them match the descriptions of children from around the United States who went missing between 1996 and the present day. Curiously, within SCP-3082's pocket dimension, the children don't physically age, and while Foundation personnel can move freely back and forth through the hatch in SCP-3082's wall, children under the age of 13 are unable to cross back through once inside the pocket dimension. It's a very extraordinary anomaly, but it was up to the very ordinary Dr. Tracy to make contact with the residents of SCP-3082. Upon entering, he discovered that the children had formed their own system of government, known as the Chief Royal Council. Dr. Tracy was introduced to many of the Council's members, including Wexley Olson, age 6, a junior Council member, Lucy Fujimoto, age 7, who had taken the role of City Planner and Resource Manager, Ahmed Saeed, age 11, who served as a caretaker to the younger citizens of SCP-3082, and Rachel Jeffries, age 10, who acted as a Council Mediator. Through interviews with the subjects, Dr. Tracy found that all 74 of the children reported they had woken up on the porch of a treehouse after running away from troubled homes. Most of the council members had disappeared in 1996, except for Olson, who disappeared in 2005. Older residents reported that some of the treehouse that make up what is now their village were already there upon their discovery of the pocket dimension. Also pre-existing within the pocket dimension was the original leader of the Chief Royal Council, a 12-year-old girl from Ohio named Aria Morrison. The Foundation was eager to speak to Morrison, as she was seemingly the first child to discover SCP-3082. 
But when Dr. Tracy asked the other children where she was, they told him that they didn't know. According to Saeed and Jeffries, Morrison abandoned the colony five months before the Foundation's arrival. It was unclear where she could have gone, as drone exploration conducted by the Foundation revealed that SCP-3082-1 was the only large living thing for miles within the pocket dimension. While the tree was thriving, the surrounding area was mostly flat, decaying, and barren. Further research into Morrison's history showed that her younger sister, Jacqueline Morrison, had also gone missing on the same night, but there was no evidence that Jacqueline had ever entered SCP-3082. The Foundation conducted their research into the biology of SCP-3082-1 while maintaining diplomatic relations with the Pocket Dimension citizens. Taking advantage of the fact that adults could move freely in and out of the hatch, the Foundation started working with the Chief Royal Council to improve the weight limits on the village systems of rope bridges, as well as providing any supplies that the children might need, such as additional food, clothing, and medical equipment. These liaisons were extremely helpful for the children, many of whom had been without adult supervision or care for over a decade. Saeed, for one example, had fallen off of a bridge and broken his leg several years earlier, and had been living with the pain caused from the bone being incorrectly set ever since. However, there was an unexpected side effect of this continued contact. While the Foundation tried to remain neutral in their involvement in the policies of 3082, through Dr. Tracy's interviews, he discovered that the SCP Foundation's presence in the treehouse had caused a schism within the Chief Royal Council. The vast majority of the children, including Saeed, Jeffries, and Fujimoto, supported the Foundation's presence and wanted to work with them to find a way to leave the world of 3082 and return back to what the children called the real world. But a splinter group had developed, calling themselves the Neverland Movement. The Neverland Movement were angered by the Foundation's interference and intended to resist any attempt to return the children to civilization. Olsen had become the de facto leader of the Splinter Group and made no secrets about his views on the Foundation. He swore at Tracy during interviews and frequently butted heads with the rest of the Council, Fujimoto in particular. At one point, Tracy overheard the two of them fighting, with Olsen arguing that Neverland gives them everything they need without any grown-ups to tell them what to do, and that they would be stupid to give that up. To which Fujimoto responded, I was here back when we were still building the village. I was here before we had safety nets, ladders, and fences, and before we figured out how to build a treehouse that wouldn't fall apart if someone leaned on a bad wall. I was here before we knew where there was more food if we needed it. When did you get here, huh? After we knew what we were doing. Listening to the conversation, Dr. Tracy heard the children refer again to Arya Morrison in a way that suggested that she had some kind of control over the environment. In reference to the incident where Saeed had broken his leg, Fujimoto said, Mary didn't fix his leg right, and this place didn't fix it either. Arya prayed, and you know what happened? Nothing. From this comment, the Foundation started to theorize that Arya had somehow been involved in the creation of SCP-3082, and Arya was officially designated as SCP-3082-2. One morning, when Dr. Tracy entered the treehouse and walked through the hatch to conduct further interviews, he was greeted by Olsen, who was the only child in the main treehouse at the time. Tracy asked what was wrong, and Olsen explained that the tree had started to change. A wooden slide had appeared between two of the tree's fruit-bearing branches, snapping the rope bridge and making the fruit more difficult to access. On top of that, Olsen said that the apples the trees produced were different now. They looked like apples from the outside, but now seemed to be made of cotton candy on the inside. Dr. Tracy put in a request for non-perishable foods to be sent through into the pocket dimension, fearing that further changes to the tree structure would mean the children would be deprived of enough proper nutrition to survive. Given these changes, it became apparent that more had to be done to understand the tree's physiology. An exploratory drone was sent into the dimension, with cameras and sensors collecting data on the lower parts of the tree that the children hadn't colonized. The expedition continued as normal, until the drone operators spotted a hollow in the tree that had not yet been documented. The cameras detected movement inside the hollow, and on closer inspection, the operators were shocked to find it was a person. More specifically, it was Arya Morrison. The cameras were only just able to confirm her identity though, as the drone was knocked out of the sky by a falling watermelon and the feed was cut. 
Before the request for a replacement drone could even be approved, though, the broken drone started transmitting again. In front of the camera was Morrison, clutching a roll of duct tape. She explained to the camera that she'd rewired the drone to resume the camera feed and remove some of the drone's fan blades, using a system where the operators of the drone would rotate the remaining blades once for yes and twice for no. The Foundation was able to hold a conversation with Morrison. She confirmed much of the information that the Foundation already had on her, that she was from Ohio, and that she and her sister Jacqueline had disappeared in 1996. During the conversation, Morrison wrote down a Morse code-like system through which to communicate more complex questions and answers, and with the help of this Morrison code, the Foundation was able to conduct a series of more in-depth interviews with the subject. The first interview occurred 44 hours after first making contact, and the drone operators explained to her the nature of the SCP Foundation in basic terms. They assured her that the other children were still safe in the village, but Morrison didn't volunteer any more information about herself. Nine days later, though, she finally told the Foundation her story. Aria and Jacqueline Morrison had a difficult childhood together. Their parents fought constantly and would often leave their sisters at home without supervision for long periods of time. Jacqueline, perhaps aided by all the time she spent alone, displayed an extremely active imagination. So active, in fact, that Aria claimed she was able to pull things out of thin air, warping reality around her to fit her imagined scenarios. Aria recalled that one year when the Morrison parents had forgotten Jacqueline's birthday, Aria tried to comfort her by saying that the family had been planning a surprise party for Jacqueline's half-birthday instead. She forgot all about the white lie until six months later, when the girl's parents took them to the park and everything Aria had told Jacqueline would be at her half-birthday was there waiting for them. Knowing the potential consequences of letting Jacqueline's power go unchecked, Aria always made sure to remind her sister to turn things back to normal after they played pretend together. One night in 1996, while their parents were having a particularly bad fight, the sisters packed a bag and ran off into the woods. After about half an hour, they got turned around, but they kept walking, just as afraid of what would happen to them if they went back home as they were of being lost in the woods. Aria lost track of Jacqueline for a moment, and suddenly found herself standing on the porch of SCP-3082. Unable to find Jacqueline anywhere, Aria searched the treehouse, and in the process, became trapped in SCP-3082's pocket dimension. The treehouse inside the pocket dimension appeared exactly as it does now, but the rest of the tree was devoid of life. Scared, alone, and running out of water, Aria sat in the treehouse and, pretending that her sister was with her, started telling a bedtime story about fruit trees and pitchers of fresh water. The next day, she awoke to find a system of rope bridges and a grove where SCP-3082-1's fruit-bearing trees and pitcher plants had sprouted overnight. Aria found that when it was in a giving mood, the tree would respond to any requests she made. More children started to appear over time, and they started making additions to the village with the tree's help. They would get what they needed to survive, but the tree refused to let them go. In Aria Morrison's own words, Jacqueline likes it too much here in Neverland. I think Jackie might listen better if I get closer to the part of her that remembers. But for now, she doesn't hear me when I say it's time to go home. Trees don't really think like people do. And so, the children continue to live in the world of SCP-3082 to this day, as a whole town of SCP Foundation personnel work to bring them back. And hopefully, if they are able to return to the real world, they'll find it's the world they deserve. Now go check out SCP-087 The Staircase and SCP-096 The Shy Guy for more. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to be the first to learn about the fascinating files from the SCP Foundation.